Hello and a very warm welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Well, India has always pursued an independent foreign policy based on its uh, national interest and its relationship with each country is independent of its relationship with the third country. The Ministry of External Affairs clarified on Friday after Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov described New Delhi as an object of the West's persistent, aggressive and devious policy against China in the Indo-Pacific. Addressing a weekly briefing, Ministry of External Affairs' spokesperson Anurag Srivastav recalled Prime Minister Narendra Modi's remarks during Shangri-La dialogue that India does not see Indo-Pacific as a strategy or a club of limited members or as a grouping uh, that seeks to dominate. At a general meeting of the Russian International Affairs Council on Tuesday, Lavrov had criticized the Quad. Meanwhile, noting the rising challenges in the Indo-Pacific region, Chief of Defence Staff General Bipin Rawat on Friday said that the world is witnessing a race for strategic bases in the Indian Ocean region, adding that it is only going to gain momentum in the times to come. Also highlighting the importance of the Indo-Pacific, General Rawat said that there are 120 warships of uh, extra-regional forces deployed in the region in support of various missions. In this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyse India's vision for the Indo-Pacific. Joining me on the programme today are Ashok Sajanhar, former ambassador, Vice Admiral Satish Soni, retired, former commander-in-chief of the Southern and Eastern Command, and Major General Drusi Katoch, retired, director, India Foundation. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Ambassador, let me begin the program with you first. You know, uh, let's talk about the comments that were made by the Russian Foreign Minister first about Quad, about how he said that India is playing to the tunes of its Western allies. And what do you make of that remark? And we have responded to that as well. No, we have responded to that remark. And I think uh, it is, uh, of course, as far as India's relations with uh, Russia are concerned, Russian Federation are concerned, they are uh, strategic, they are very close, after all, in a large number of areas whether it is uh, defense equipment, defense purchases, and not only purchases, now it is also in terms of development of the defense platforms that is taking place in India. It is not only a buyer-seller relationship, but we are also manufacturing those in India. Also, as far as nuclear energy is concerned, the uh, Russian Federation is a very important partner, very close partner. In fact, uh, Russia is the only country which has established uh, uh, nuclear power plants. We have uh, uh, the first uh, three units of Kudan Kulam that are already functioning. We have three more uh, units that will be coming up. Six more units should be coming up in Andhra Pradesh. In fact, the only country, as I said, uh, with whom we have uh, nuclear uh, uh, technology, civil nuclear technology cooperation. Uh, also, in the area of uh, energy, whether it is uh, oil, whether it is gas, or it is uh, uh, it is uh, uh, coal. Uh, we have very good uh, relations. So uh, in all senses, it's a very close uh, strategic global partnership with uh, Russia. But as far as the whole issue of uh, the Indo-Pacific and the Quad is concerned, we have uh, ever since the time that it was uh, launched uh, in 2017 for the first time, and it's been moving forward, we have been uh, reaching out to Russia and we've been trying to explain to them, as uh, you mentioned and as uh, the Prime Minister had mentioned at the Shangri-La Dialogue on uh, the 1st of June 2018, that uh, this is not a strategy, this is not an uh, initiative, it's not a club of limited members, it is not directed against any country. It is uh, a pure uh, geographical con construct and uh, basically it is to ensure a free, open, inclusive uh, uh, region, both uh, uh, of the Indo-Pacific, in which uh, countries of the region and those who are outside the region but who have stakes of uh, stability in the region, they would uh, uh, participate. After that, India has even uh, floated what is known at the East Asia Summit last year in Bangkok, the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. So uh, India has been trying to reach out and explain to Russia at different fora, at different level, whether it is uh, through discussions in the think tanks like the Waldai Club or the others, or even in our official interactions, we have been trying to explain to them 
that it is uh, basically to ensure that the global commons of this region, whether it is South China Sea or otherwise, that there should be freedom of navigation, that there should be uh, uh, there should be resolution of disputes through dialogue, there should be rule of law which should be observed, an international rule of law, and uh, so. Uh, but uh, at this moment, I find that uh, Russia, because it is being pressurized by the West, mm. it finds that it has to go along with China. And so, you know, what I saw in Mr. Lavrov's statement is shades of what uh, I have read, uh, you know, Global Times are saying so often that it is China, India that is being weaned away from here by the West uh, and uh, India is being set up against uh, China, which, right. uh, would, uh, which does not really give uh, enough uh, uh, important significance to India's own perspective. Uh, perspective of its own national interest that it can uh, pursue it. So I would imagine that although India and uh, Russia, they have very good relations, but at the moment, uh, Russia finds that its interests are uh, with China. It would like to maintain its transactional ties with India, but uh, then its uh, interests also are very strong with China. Right. Absolutely. All right. So, uh, Admiral, let me bring you in here now. Since we spoke about the Quad, you know, as far as the Quad's potential is concerned, is that something that concerns those who are not part of the Quad? Uh, well, I would say uh, certainly uh, it does. And uh, uh, to some extent, uh, that, uh, you know, should be the aim. Uh, quad, uh, the idea first came about in 2007. And uh, as it happened, that was also the first time that we had a multilateral uh, Malabar exercise. Though Malabar is not connected to Quad, and the Malabar exercise started in 1992. So uh, I suppose uh, that was uh, the beginning of Quad, you know, and then we had the governments of Australia and Japan and even India. They, uh, they took a step back. And then in 2017, as uh, Ambassador Shok said, you know, the idea is reborn and rejuvenated and there is a lot of interest. And whilst, uh, you know, we say that it is not aimed at anything, anyone in particular, but uh, I think uh, the concern uh, is uh, China's assertiveness and China's uh, coercive behavior. Uh, Malabar and Quad are also not linked. But uh, again, the participation and inclusion of uh, Australia uh, in the last uh, Malabar, uh, we seem to be sending a signal, whether we like it or not, that uh, you know there is going to be a military face to the Quad. But uh, Quad, in my view, is uh, is still uh, you know is a fledgling organization. Where it will lead, we can't really say. Uh, the cooperation would extend in which fields, it depends a lot. Right now, I think, uh, um, you know, during the pandemic, uh, we discussed a lot about health issues. We could, we could be uh, discussing uh, non-traditional issues. Uh, the cooperation between the navies has uh, commenced. Uh, we don't know where this leads to. Uh, are we going to have a secretariat of Quad? Is the Quad... Uh, going to, uh, you know, broaden in participation? Are we going to see have uh, Quad Plus dialogue as we in, in fact saw a couple of months back when the Quad and Q nations like South Korea, etc., you know, met on the sidelines? Um, or is it that uh, these uh, four countries deepen their relationship? So does the Quad uh, deepen or does the Quad uh, broaden? Uh, I think uh, we are yet to see a very clear picture, but I think a lot, lot will depend on, uh, you know, what the smaller nations, how they take it. You know, right. the smaller nations are very important, uh, the, especially the countries uh, of the ASEAN. Uh, if they don't see uh, this squad coming uh, on their side, then it will weaken. As we have seen in the past, though the U.S. has had um, you know, uh, co defense cooperative agreements, whether it is with the Philippines or Japan. Or, but uh, how many times they have really come out, you know, to their help, whether it was uh, the Mischief incident or it is the Scarborough Shoal incident. 
So there has to be a military commitment. Uh, there has to be a revolve, resolve to act uh, uh, militarily against a uh, coercive activity of China. So I think Quad is still in a very fledgling phase. We right. uh, we will see a lot of it, and uh, right now uh, a clearer picture is uh, you know yet to emerge. Absolutely, General. Let me bring you in now. You know, as far as uh Yes, these aspects that we've spoken about, something that India has been continuously reiterating as well, free, uh, open, inclusive, freedom of navigation, rules-based order, etc. in the Indo-Pacific, you know. But what do you do when some of the stakeholders in the region actually don't go by these rules, where they don't believe in any of the rules? What options do you have and what, what is it that we need to focus on then? Oh, what I feel about this whole situation is that when we are looking at the Indo-Pacific, there is a fundamental law of physics which says that a vacuum will be filled. And the Chinese for very long are perceiving a shift in balance of power and they are trying to fill that vacuum. Now, I want to take your mind back to the Vietnam War when the French left. Half of the Paris was occupied by China because there was a vacuum. And when the Americans left, they occupied the other half. Uh, the Chinese have always tried, attempted to expand whenever they perceive a chance to do so. And I think this is what is being, uh, what is being uh, uh, looked at by the other powers, that we cannot let a unilateral expansion of power by China in this particular region. And this is what the concerns of China are, because as far as the Chinese are concerned, they want it to be unilateral that whatever China says must be accepted by all. And that is certainly not going to be accepted by the rest of the world. So in this context, I would like to see the Quad, that when we are looking at the Quad, or specifically when India is looking at the Quad, we are looking at, as you very rightly mentioned, a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, very correctly, as uh, you know, when enumerated by the Prime Minister, uh, it, it must be rules-based. Now, at this point of time, we don't, we don't see the Chinese conforming to any rules, uh, as you can see what happened in the dispute with, uh, between China and the Philippines, where, they, um, where they, uh, the China refused to accept um, what the world body had said. And uh, they still lay claim to 90% of the South China Sea. Now, I think that is as absurd as it gets. So in my view, things have to change. Now, the Quad, as very rightly spoken by the Admiral, as of now, is a very, very loose structure. But I also believe, and he has also stated the same, the potential for it for, to, from becoming a very loose structure, a very cohesive structure, can take place in a very, very short span of time. And I think this particular aspect is what concerns the Chinese. They know the potential of the Quad. Uh, I, think this, uh, I think the time has now come where, an, uh, where, uh, where a very overtly aggressive China, uh, there, it needs to be addressed holistically. And to address it holistically, it is not simply enough to talk about maintaining peace and open seas as far as the Indo-Pacific is concerned. I think the Quad countries must now get down to having a very simple agenda, uh, put, out, put down that agenda and let all the four Quad countries conform to it. After that, once this agenda is set up, I have no doubts in my mind that every single country of ASEAN will jump onto that bandwagon. At the moment also, they are looking at it as, uh, uh, as a situation uh, which is developing, and very rightly so. The Admiral has correctly stated it is a developing situation, but we cannot allow this to be a developing situation in perpetuity. Uh, one last point, uh, which, uh, which I would just like to mention uh, in passing, uh, is your opening remarks about the Russian reaction. Now, uh, I won't be as diplomatic as the Ambassador. Uh, you see, uh, when, the, when, the, when the Russians are claiming that, uh, you know, the Americans are booing us away, let us remember, it was the Chinese which carried out aggression in eastern Ladakh, which led to the problem. And I'm sure the Chinese were not looking at American instructions. So it was a unilateral, uh, unacceptable action by China which has created the problem. They are doing the same thing in the South China Sea, and they must be confronted. Because if the bully is not confronted, he will continue to get away uh, and continue his behavior in like manner. Frank. All right. Oh. Taking the discussion forward now, I'm going to ask my panelists to be brief as well because you spent about 15 minutes on our opening remarks. So, you know, Ambassador, uh, 
when you look at the Indo-Pacific as a whole, you know, are more countries now worried about China's hegemony in the region? I say that because, you know, the Germans recently came out with a paper really as far as the Indo-Pacific is concerned. The Europeans certainly seem to be concerned. They seem to be rethinking their strategy. The French, of course, are with us uh, on, on most of the things that we do. So is this, is the world now more concerned or more worried about what China can do in the region or is doing in the region? I think the world is definitely getting uh, much more uh, concerned, anxious and worried. And that I think is particularly, of course, it's been building for the last uh, several years, but particularly since the beginning of the, uh, this year, particularly since the onset of the pandemic, this has become much more obvious. One, of course, is in terms of the flexing of muscles by China. And we see it uh, not only against India and the Ladakh border. And, uh, you know, just to mention that point about what uh, Sergei Lavrov said, I think uh, just giving a clean check to China uh, as far as this border is concerned, when India has very clearly stated that it was a premeditated and a pre-planned attack by China, I think that uh, uh, definitely doesn't uh, do uh, justice to our uh, very uh, strong and uh, strategic partnership. But uh, coming back to the question that we are discussing, yes, China has been flexing its muscles. In South China, you see, you see what it has been uh, doing uh, in terms of uh, uh, the nine dash line claiming 90% of the South China Sea. Of course, it has been claiming for a long time, but now it is exercising that domination and that control. And it is saying that uh, uh, the uh, ships that go through it, they will have to inform, they'll have to seek permission. Also in terms of overflights, also as far as East China Sea is concerned, Taiwan Straits is concerned. So concern is there, you are very right, as far as France, Germany, they have come with the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, the United Kingdom is going to send its uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, its uh, 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 ship in, in the South China Sea waters. So uh, everyone is getting concerned. We, uh, as far as uh, the pandemic is concerned, we had uh, started working together. You know, it was a quad plus structure that yeah. was created with uh, Vietnam, with uh, South Korea, with New Zealand. We were working with them at the foreign secretary level, vice minister level on a weekly basis. So yes, everyone is getting concerned. Uh, China has also been weaponizing its supply chains. You remember how yeah. it refused to supply even PPEs or the ventilators to countries which uh, uh, were not, uh, which uh, were suggesting, even suggesting that uh, the Wuhan virus came out of China, so to say. Uh, it's uh, uh, coercive uh, economic coercion against Australia. So I think all these things are very clear. But then how does the world come together? How right. does it create a unified strategy to deal with China? I think that is the big question because I'll finish with this, that uh, if you look at the exports of uh, China in November, they have risen by 21% as compared to their exports in November of 2019, which means that although the sentiments are there, but there is at the moment no desire to take uh, 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 preemptive action, specific action. So the world really has to walk the talk. I think India is doing it to a, a significant extent. Our imports have come down from China, but I think the world also needs to come together. And that is where the success of the Quad will also lie, Frank. Absolutely. All right. So, Admiral, since we are here, let me draw your attention to what the CDS uh, General Rawat said as well, you know, about how the race is on to, you know, to militarize bases in the Indo-Pacific. That is one. He is also talking about the importance of the Indo-Pacific as well. So, what should India's strategy be in the region? Uh, the Indian Ocean has been somewhat a zone of peace, you know, in, uh, say, before the 15th century. Traders sailed across the ocean. There was a policy of live and let live. Uh, with the arrival of Vasco da Gama, uh, things changed. And then we were, the ocean was dominated by the uh, British, which, who were backed by the Royal Navy. And then after the Cold War, uh, after the World War II, we had the US, which has been dominating this area. But essentially, there has been, uh, you know, some kind of a maritime order. 
and now uh, our challenger has emerged in china and china in 2008 for the first time they came in with just two old ships and an oiler and uh, now uh, 10 to 12 ships are always uh, uh, present over here um, they have opened a base in uh, djibouti uh, there is going to be a base coming up in uh, gwadar they are going number of logistic bases which are sprinkled all over uh, the indian ocean uh, and they are uh, they are not in a position as of now to keep the indian ocean under surveillance which they are of south china sea and the Uh, western pacific so uh, they are not asserting themselves as much in the indian indian ocean as of now but five years down the line um, i can see that you know they will have the entire uh, md available to them they will have long range maritime patrol aircraft they will be in collision with the pakistan navy to dominate areas in the uh, western indian ocean uh, and uh, you, i won't be surprised if uh, they announce uh, their uh, first uh, overseas uh, command based in uh, gwadar so uh, the indian ocean is certainly going to be uh, militarized and it is not only in china i mean uh, not only china you see recent announcement by russia that they are going to open a base in uh, sudan which is for their own interest you know the flow of oil their you know uh, the truck with uh, Uh, Saudi Arabia to control the oil prices to show that the oil flows freely to the sector. So, uh, what does the Indian do? I think India must realize that uh, Indian Ocean region comes first for us. Hmm. We presently don't have a navy which can really assert itself uh, and dis- to distant seas. Certainly, it's a blue water navy now. and uh, in uh, uh, in coordination with other navies like the us navy the french navy and the royal navy we can you know participate in exercises out of this area but indian ocean region i think and the smaller countries uh, must remain on top of our list we must make sure that they are dependent on us for their security that we are their preferred security partner and they don't have to look beyond us with regard to meeting their non traditional threats and traditional threats and they don't give uh, in an opportunity for countries like china uh, to right. come in that is sure. uh, what i that we should be doing. absolutely you. general since we are here you know is it uh, you, you know how difficult is it for some of these smaller countries really to be weaned away from china because you know if you look at the asean countries they have a unique kind of a problem the others too of course china with its deep pockets goes in with the money and then it becomes difficult for countries to stay away from china as well so in that kind of a situation in that kind of a scenario what should uh, you know our uh, our strategy be uh frank the first aspect is as far as the asean countries are concerned you know they most of them they actually border they have land borders with china so once you have a land border with china and um, the chinese economic strength being what it is it stands to reason that china will exercise some level of control over them now that is where the hedging strategy comes in because unless you can hedge with somebody else uh, you will go with you will go with whatever is available and i think that is that is why the quad is very important and it has to be made effective because if we don't make the quad effective then all the asean countries will not see it really in their interest to go along with the quad so to make the squad effective i think there are just two or three things which are required and i'll be very brief one i think the four countries should get together and first define the limits you know when we are actually talking about the geographical area you will find all the four quad countries talking of different geographies this is one number two let us get on to a common agenda at the point of at this point of time we do not have an agenda so we should get down to that agenda number three there has to be the military component because once you put the military component in and the economic component in then you will find uh, a very strong force developing number 4 i think get the european powers on board france is on board get the other european powers on board i'm quite certain the uk and the european union will get on board so once we have that that structure in place i see no reason why the asean countries won't come on board uh, russia well russia is going to play its own game russia is um, uh, Russia has got its own concerns, but leaving Russia out, I think the rest of the world can unite. And if the rest of the world unites, ASEAN will be part of that grouping. Frank. 
Absolutely. All right, time to get quick closing comments from all my panelists now with the best way forward. Limited time, so I'm going to ask you to be brief, starting first with your ambassador. Well, let me uh, share a few thoughts as far as the Quad is concerned. I would tend to agree to an extent with the previous two speakers that Quad is work in progress. But I would also like to underline that a lot of progress has been made over the last three years. You know, since 2017, when it first came into position, over two years, it was meeting at very low mid-level officials. For the first time last year, it met uh, on the uh, sidelines of the UN General Assembly at the level of the ministers. And this time, during the pandemic on the 6th of October, all the four ministers traveled specifically to have this meeting in Tokyo. So I think this symbolic message has gone that these countries are very, very serious. Right. I think in terms of the agenda, they have developed a very strong, powerful agenda. They are talking about pandemic. They are talking about economic recovery. They are talking about connectivity. They are talking about infrastructure. They are talking about 5G. They are talking about cybersecurity. Across the board, they are talking about all these issues. Mm. They have decided that from now on, they are going to be meeting every year at ministerial level. I think Quad is well on its way to institutionalization and formalization of the structure at foreign minister level. In right. addition, there are, you know, getting all the ASEAN together will not work. I think we have to pick and choose which are the countries like Vietnam, like Indonesia, like Philippines. Mm. I think these are the countries which Laos and Cambodia and Thailand, I think we can forget about that. In addition to that, Europe, I think definitely we can get them. And once we start building on uh, issues which are, let us say, infrastructure, connectivity, which are of interest to these countries, I think there will be much greater interest Security is an aspect, but I don't think we should wave the flag of security in front of us. Otherwise, it is going to drive away some right. of these countries which are under the domination of China. Frank. Admiral? Uh, well, I would say that uh, history rhymes, and we must not forget that um, uh, the United Kingdom or England was able to dominate the world uh, back on the, royal, the strength of the Royal Navy. And the, the U.S. today dominates the world. It is on the strength of the U.S. Navy. And if uh, uh, in, uh, countries like India and China were colonized, it was because we did not give importance uh, to our uh, maritime spaces. And if China today is going to dominate and is emerging as a rival, it is because we are concentrating on the Navy. So we must learn from these lessons and invest in our Navy. Today, our defense budget is, you know, uh, is very low. And the mm. Navy's share in that defense budget has come down from 18% to some 14 odd percent. Our acquisition programs are very low and there are you know, gaps which are emerging. If we want to play any meaningful role, uh, we would need a strong Navy and we must invest in it. Thank Absolutely. You. General, close the show for us. All right, Frank. I've just got two very basic comments. One, of course, the quad, I think, has to be based on economic and other parameters. But that can only work if you have the military muscle behind it. And I think without that military muscle, all other things will not work. But the military muscle of, will not be kept in the front. It is simply a stick which is kept at the back burner. Number two, as far as India is concerned, I'm totally with the Admiral. <clears throat> as an infantry man, as an army man, I say we need to strengthen the Indian Navy. We need the third carrier and we need those additional submarines. It is not either the submarines or the carrier. I think the time has come to say we need both and we need to, uh, to ratchet up the resources for that. Hmm. That will enable us to exercise that level of dominance in the Indian Ocean, which will assist the Quad in carrying out its other functions. Frank. All right. On that note, then, I'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. What's coming out of this discussion is that as far as the Indo-Pacific is concerned, India is very clear that we need a free, open and inclusive region. That's what we have always wanted and that's what we clarified as well recently. India has reached out and informed all the stakeholders that uh, there should be freedom of navigation and a rules-based order. There is an anti-China sentiment, but the world has uh, not done anything concrete about it to take on China, and that is the biggest problem. We have to make Quad more effective and also support smaller countries in the region. We have to militarize the Quad and have an agenda as far as the Quad is concerned, and also bring 
other like-minded countries together and expand the network of Quad and make it more stronger. With that, it's a wrap. See you again next time.